record this, so I will stop it for. All right, so we will now uh, start off, of course, with the the concept itself. Oh, so what we have learned so far is that Article Eleven Fifty Six only covers civil obligation, because as you will take note, Article Eleven Fifty Six. Uh, uh, requires a juridical necessity. And when we talk of the juridical necessity, that is the very element that would be necessary so as there could be what you call a cause of action to enforce the fulfillment of the prestation of the obligation in our courts of law, correct? So natural obligation, and uh, moral obligation, we will find out that no longer have this juridical necessity. Except, of course, and when we come to the distinction between natural obligation and civil obligation, the concept of voluntary fulfillment, which I discussed thoroughly in my, in my recorded video for you, where there would now be a new obligation that would be established if it is proven that there was a voluntary fulfillment of the natural obligation by the debtor. Now, moral obligation does not have the same effect. So that would make, that would establish the distinction between the moral and the natural. Although we pointed out their similarity, okay, to be that both no longer has a juridical necessity, so, unlike the civil. So we only talk about civil obligations now. Okay, now from the definition, the first thing, of course, that I am supposed to have asked you if I did call for recitations would be the uh, requisites of this obligation, so meaning civil obligation. So there are, there are four essential requisites. What are these? All right, first, the subjects, uh, they are, of course, the passive subject, referred also as the debtor, or referred sometimes as the obligor. Now, they, uh, the debtor, the obligor, the passive subject is defined as the person who may be compelled uh, to fulfill the prestation. So that is how you should define the concept of a debtor in civil obligation. The second, of course, is the active subject, who is also referred to as the creditor or the obligee. Oh, you see what? Obligee, obligea, life goes on. Ah, is defined as the person who may require the fulfillment of the prestation through the courts of law. So may cause of action siya. So there are two subjects, the passive and the active. All right. Now, what would be the qualifications in order for a party to be a debtor in an obligation? Now, no, there are only two requirements. What are these? One, that he must be a juridical person. So you remember what you took up in family, in persons in family law the two types of persons under the civil code, the natural and the artificial person. So any of these two types may be a debtor because they comply with the first requirement that they must be a person under civil law. Okay, so uh, a cat, a dog, an old oak tree cannot be a debtor as they are not considered to be persons under the civil code. Now, in addition to being a person, you will note that a debtor generally should also have the capacity to act. So you know already that uh, concept of the capacity to act or merely referring to those who do have already what you call the capability to enter into relationships that results to a legal effect in or in a way those that may be held liable for obligations or they can be referred to 
as those capable of entering into a valid contract. So in Article, of course, in Article 1328 of the Civil Code, as we will come to that in the future, it enumerates the persons who are incapacitated. So generally, these persons who are incapacitated cannot be debtors, except, of course, if they are represented by their legal guardian or in cases of minors, their parents. Now also, minors, okay, although generally are incapacitated to enter into a contract, there are certain contracts to which the law okay, allows them to enter into to and resulting to the to the to them being debtors also. The best example of which is, of course, the purchase of necessities. Okay, so minors, although generally are incapacitated to enter into a contract, they are, however, qualified to in cases of agreement to acquire their necessities. And the necessities, then, of course, food in the stomach, uh, roof on the head, clothing, education, and medical expenses. So, in effect, this agreement, they may be debtors already that regard. But for, for our purposes, okay, generally they cannot. That is why uh, an incapacitated cannot on their own, except for some instances or contracts that we have mentioned, cannot be debtors. Do you understand? So dalawa yang requisite na yan. Now, how about being a creditor? Uh, who may be a creditor? Note that being creditor entails a right, not the imposition of a burden or an obligation. In this particular case, therefore, it is only necessary that the party be a person under the civil code. So there is no necessity to make the qualification of having the capacity to act. Uh, as a matter of fact, you encountered in your study of the law on donations in the family code that an unborn child may already be the donee of a donation and becomes valid if he is born alive and is able to survive within a period, minimum period, as prescribed to by law. So in effect, even that baby in the mother's womb may now be a creditor as a donee, okay, having a right to enforce an obligation on his or her donor. Oh, if I know, okay, so Shepre, oh, that baby cannot be a debtor yet. Because if the law already allows a baby to be a debtor. Ay po, hindi na yan lalabas at yan ang nanay mo. <laughs> Bata ko lalabas pa. Wala pa akong ginagawa. May utang na. Ano? Oh, you understand? So, when it comes to creditor, it is only legal personality that would be necessary. So, but of course, uh, a pet dog, a cat, uh, an old oak tree are not persons in the civil law, therefore cannot also be a creditor. So those are the only requirements in so far as the passive and the active subjects are concerned. Okay, now let us go to the third, which is the most important. The object of the obligation or sometimes referred to as the prestation. So when we come to the object of the obligation or the prestation, this refers to what the debtor may be compelled to fulfill. So although it's referred to as an object that connotes that you have to enumerate proper or improper nouns, it actually refers to the verbs that are provided for in the law. These are to give, to do, not to do. Okay, so remember this again, huh? 
uulit-ulitin ko ito dahil tatanungin kung nagtatanungin ito. What are the objects of an obligation? These are referring to those acts to which the debtor may be compelled to fulfill. Meaning, to give, right? To do, not to do. Question, sir. How about the obligation not to give? Is that also an object of an obligation? Answer, yes. But authorities have agreed that it is assumed by the concept of not to do. Good example of an obligation not to give, of course, would be the presidential decree uh, prohibiting what you call now us from uh, patronizing the mendicants along the streets of uh, Metro Manila, the anti-mendicancy law for reasons that uh, it endangers, it puts them to risk uh, by begging in the busy streets of Manila, particularly the minors. Kaya nung Pasko, di ba? Patapit, ang daming mga mendicant dyan, mga indigenous, mga aita daw yung galing sa Zambales who came over you were not supposed to patronize them because there is a law creating an obligation not to do, meaning not to give them, not to patronize them. Okay, so in effect, if I am to ask you, what are the objects of the obligation? Remember, ha? Huh? They do not refer to the things that is to be done or the thing that is to be given, but rather it refers to either giving something, doing, or not doing. Tatlo lang yan. Entindihan nyo? Okay, now, how do you distinguish that from the thing that is to be given? Or the, 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 the uh, objective that is to be done? Now, the thing to be given is the object of the prestation. Or... The object of the object of the obligation. So do not confuse the object of the prestation from the prestation of the obligation. Gets nyo? So if I am supposed to give you um, a sum of money, okay? So there is an obligation to give. So what is the object of the obligation? To give. But what is the object of that prestation? The money. Now you will find out that that object of the prestation is the object of a contract. So that would be the difference between the two because you will also have to memorize or always remember what you refer to as the object of the contract because there are three requisites of a contract, di ba? Consent, object, and the cause. So pag tinanong ka what is the object of the contract, that refers to the thing Okay, if it involves an obligation to give, it is the thing that is to be delivered. So in a contract of loan, the object of the obligation is to give. But the object of the contract is the money. Or the money is the object of the prestation of the obligation. Kaya it is the object of the object of the obligation. You understand, class? Now, all right. So uh, you need to already be introduced to the concept of later na pala, after that na. Okay. So uh, now, what are the requisites in order that a prestation or the object may be valid? There are four requisites that we have to agree on. Because there is a school of thought. There are two schools of thought. Uh, one of who, one of who, the two insisting only on three. But we must adhere to the school of thought that insists on four requisites of a valid prestation. So what are these valid prestations of an uh, or what are the what are the the requisites of a valid prestation pala. All right. Number one, of course, it must be possible. So, kailangan magagampanan. Physically, right? Uh, susceptible of being fulfilled. 
Number two, that it must be legitimate. So illegal prestations, even if it is possible to fulfill, okay, uh, would not uh, create a valid enforceable civil obligation. Number three, it must be determined or at least determinable. Now, what do we understand by determined or at least determinable? Two things. One, okay, the obligation must be clear in regard to the object and in regard to the object of that object or the object of the prestation, particularly if it is to game. So for example, it is clear that from the contract, it creates an obligation to game, the object of the uh, obligation, the game. But it also has to be clear in regard to what is to be given. To do, all right? So the object of the obligation is to do. But it has to be clear also what is to be done the object of the prestation. So it is either determined or at least determinable. Now, why? what is the distinction between the two terms? Pag sinabi yung determined, right there and then, alam mo na yung two, yung dalawang yon, malinaw na. I am to give what? Sum of money, 500,000. Determined na yan. However, there are instances when although you have determined already the object of the obligation, the prestation, the object itself of the prestation may not that be clear yet. Gets nyo? Good example of which is the common practice of some business people who enters into an agreement with farmers. Uh, lalo na pag uh, yung mga taga Lucena dito o taga Laguna, or yung mga taga-gimaras in regard to the acquisition of the probable produce of Lanzones, uh, you know, farm or uh, mango plantation. May ibang mga tinatawag yan yung pinapakyaw na. Hindi si Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao does not have anything to do with it. But there are some who go down to the farmland it deals with farmers already, even vegetables. Pineapple, for example, titingnan lang nila yung tanim, wala pa mga bunga yan, pinapakyaw na nila yan. They already enter into an agreement that they are going to acquire whatever fruits may be produced in the future. Now, is that valid? Okay, why do you raise the issue of it valid? Because... Although it, the, the object of the obligation is already determined, the object of the prestation is not yet. It does not even exist yet. Bulaklak pa lang. But you will know that it is certain that in the future, it will be determined. Kaya tinatawag yan, determinable in the near future. Oh. It's also a risk. Because whether or not the, the property, the farm produces the fruits, he will just have to pay for the obligation already as he voluntarily agreed with the farmer or the, the agricultural property owner. If you will learn it in the, in the law on sales, that is why what you call... Uh, a sale may be entered into even over a thing that has does, does not exist yet. Yan din tawag na future thing. Oh, so for example, oh, be, be, you are an artist and then uh, you, you have not yet painted the the uh, you have not yet created something in your canvas but ito na yung mama bibiling ko yan ako ano man i-paint mo diyan. Oh. So is that already a valid sale? Yes. Is there already an obligation? Yes. What is the object of the obligation? To do. What is to be done? Yan ang determinable pa, but in a near certain future to come. So na intindihan niyo na? Okay, now, 
the first school of thought that I pointed out earlier or identified says that this should only be the three requisites for a valid prestation. But the second school of thought insists that there should be the fourth. Arturo Tolentino insists that the fourth would be there should be value consideration in money or it is susceptible of pecuniary estimation. So it has to be valued in terms of money. Now, let me explain to you the position of the first school of thought that insists that money value of the prestation need not always be present. They argued that there are certain prestations that cannot be the subject of a money equivalent because their value would not only be based on the integral or what you call now physical attributes of the thing or the work to be done, but rather there would be some other means of equating its value, like sentimental value, like historical value, uh, like religious value. Do you understand? Now, these are matters that sometimes you no longer could really equate in terms of money. Kaya yung mga tinatawag na priceless na sinasabi mo. Okay? Now, that is the reason why a prestation need not always have value in money. But Tolentino insists not more. Even uh, things that are object of the prestation to give or works that are objects of the prestation to do, although considered to be priceless, still the necessity of having a money equivalent. Why does Tolentino insist on this? It is because he said that if you look at Article 1170, look at Article 1170 now, look at it. It is the provision of the law in Chapter 2 that creates the obligation on the part of the debtor to pay damages in case the obligation or the prestation itself is rendered impossible to fulfill due to what? The, the delay, negligence, fraud, or contravention of the tenor of the obligation by the debtor. Ang ibig sabihin, okay, hindi na magagampanan ng debtor yung obligasyon. Bakit? Dahil sa kanyang pabaya, kasalanan, sa pamamagitan ng okay, delay, negligence, fraud, or contravention of the tenor thereof. So, if a thing, therefore, is not susceptible of being equated in a sum of money, and this unfortunate event occurs, depriving now the debtor from fulfilling his obligation due to his own fault, what would now be the remedy of the creditor? Let's say, you know, here is a tin can, a tin cup. And so, magano lang yan. If you just consider the attributes of its uh, 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 what is made of, tinga, ni hindi pa, ni hindi pa ata limang piso yan eh. Kinikilo nga yan, yan eh. But what if, it is established, it is discovered and established to be the Holy Grail, the very cup that our Lord used during the Last Supper where he first performed the transformation of the wine into his own blood. I know, it just, that becomes really priceless, my friends. Nothing, diba? Yung, yung Indiana Jones na hinahanap yun nila, the Holy Grail. Oh. So it's priceless. Ngayon, 
You're supposed to deliver that to me. But because of your negligence, you lost it. You destroyed it. Nilagay mo sa microwave. Tatanga-tanga. Hindi naman microwaveable yun. Ginawa yun nung panahon ni Jesus Christo. Wala pang microwave. Eh, tatanga-tanga ka. Ginagay mo sa microwave. Na tunaw. No, wala. So, the issue now is, what is now my cause of action? I cannot longer compel you to fulfill it. Wala. Kasi impossible na eh. So, ano na lang gagawin ko? Nga, nga, nga na lang ako. Nga, 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 nga. Ipa sa Diyos na lang. No. There has to be at least, okay, and a money equivalent. Whether the debtors, whether the parties agree or not as to the actual value of the thing that was lost, it has to be equated to certain money value for purposes of compensation. Damages as referred to in 1170. Even the life of a person, correct? You kill someone. Oh, now what would be the the remedy aside from you having the criminal responsibility? Oh, you know already, Article One Hundred creates two separate, distinct obligations on the part of that uh, of that debtor who committed an act or omission, killing someone. Criminal, he goes to jail. Civil, he has to pay. Pay for what? The life of the person he ended. Why is the life of a person subject to pecuniary value? Supposedly, it's it's some kind of uh, impossible. It's some it's 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 uh, uh, not allowed to value the um, a person's life. But there is the need for it to compensate the heirs. So ba titingnan ngayon yan yung idad ng pinatay mo yung yung uh, capacity to earn income, the years that he could still earn the income. So you multiply that. That is the reason why uh, that would be equal to the amount. Uh, you will study in Torts and Damages, the biggest ever award uh, that was uh, uh, allowed by the Supreme Court, amounting to about uh, uh, half a billion pesos against mercury drug. Yeah, yung truck driver nila, yung cargo ng mercury, yung nabanggang Mercedes-Benz, anak ng baka, naging baldado yung vice president ng banko who was still at the prime of his age. I don't know until now, I think he is still alive. What happened about 20 years ago. So, dahil kinumpute ng Supreme Court, Ako, kinikita dito ngayon, ito, eh, ang bata pa nito, healthy. Oh, so dahil baldado, hindi na. So kinumpute ngayon, unlucky. Oh, you see? So everything need to be the subject of money equivalent. So for our purposes class, we adhere to the second uh, uh, school of thought that the requisite for a prestation there are four. It's possible. It must be legal. Okay. Uh, it is determined or at least determinable. And number four, it is subject to money equivalent. Or maybe this is, uh, it may be susceptible of pecuniary estimation, as a Tolentino referred to. Oh, you understand now? Okay. And finally, and finally, please stay no class. We talk about the vinculum. This, when you talk of the vinculum, uh, the tie itself, we refer that binds the parties. Uh, we refer to the sources of obligation. So the vinculum, the tie, would be classified into what? are enumerated in Article 1157. So these are law, contract, quasi-contracts, acts or omission punishable by law, and quasi-delict. So yan ang vinculum. That which is the basis for the juridical necessity to 
compel fulfillment of the prestation by the creditor, okay, on the debtor. Do you understand, class? Now, uh, before we leave these four requisites and go now to uh, each and every uh, source as enumerated in Article 1157, okay, you have to exactly know the concept of a reciprocal obligation. Na. Although, although alam nyo na kung ano ito. Because, you see, uh, why is it important for you to, to know the requisites? This is the very first. This is the very first thing that you will need to determine on whether or not there is a cause of action uh, to compel an alleged fulfillment of an obligation. Dapat ma-point out nyo yung apat na ito. Nakuha nyo? Ha? So, uh, may dudulog sa inyo. Pag-abugado na kayo, kahit hindi pa kayo abugado. Pero mayroong kaibigan, lumapit sa inyo. Uh, naglireklamo sa iyo na, na agrabyado siya na lugi siya nasaktan siya gusto niyang bawian ano ba meron ba akong uh, karapatan na idulog ito sa korte para hilingin itong kabayaran uh, itong uh, itong kabastusan na ginawa niya sa akin ay dapat maparusahan uh, so pag pinakinggan ninyo na yung narration niya ng ng kwento ukul sa pagkalugi niya, pagkasak nasaktan siya, you will now try to identify the poor requisites. So what are these requisites? So, sino ang debtor? So, siyempre yung rinireklamo. Sino ang creditor? Yan, yung nagrireklamo sa iyo. So, malalaman ninyo na kung ano yung prestation. Do you understand? So, and thereafter, of course, you will now look for whether that obligation you see may be sourced out from any of the five as enumerated in 1157. So the issue now here is, are these the only sources of civil obligation? Ito lang ba? Meaning, is it exclusive? Or are there others that may not have been identified by Article 1157? Tolentino said that it is not exclusive. There are still some sources of obligation not included in the enumeration. However, I think it has been settled already by the Supreme Court. First, in the case of La Orden de Pedecadores versus Nacoco, and the most recent latest case is the case of Makati Stock Exchange versus versus Luxin. Correct? Or Luxon ba yun? Luxin ba yun o Luxon? Uh, you, both cases you came across in our case book. Correct? Huh? But these are the two most significant cases uh, where it now established the jurisprudence that Article 1157 is exclusive. Naintindihan nyo? So ang ibig sabihin, kahit malinaw na merong uh, obligation na dapat gampanan itong taong rinireklamo, kailangan mahanap ninyo kung saan pwedeng hugutin dito sa lima. Is it arising from law? Is it arising from contracts? Is it quasi-contract? Is it act or omission punishable by law? Or is it quasi delict Because if you cannot identify from where the obligation may have arisen, arisen from, then you do not have any civil obligation. You do not have any juridical necessity. You follow, class? All right. So case at point, of course, the case of Makati Stock Exchange. Ano ang pangalan niya? Makati Stock Exchange versus Luxin or Luxon? Luxon ata o Luxin. Anyway, uh, the title. What happened there? Uh, Mr. Luxin retired as chairman of the board of the Makati Stock Exchange after serving as chairman thereof for many years. Right. Now, 
as in recognition of the services that he rendered uh, the board of directors, the present board of directors, okay, uh, gave to him the title Chairman Emeritus. Parang symbolic recognition yan that for in our eyes, although you no longer function and be allowed to exercise the duties, responsibilities, and authority, but in our eyes, you are still our chairman, chairman emeritus. For example, uh, you did not get to meet uh, the most recent uh, Dean Emeritus granted by San Beda University, uh, the, the Dean previous to Dean Delson, Dean Virgilio Hara. So Dean Virgilio Hara is no longer the incumbent Dean, but has been awarded the recognition as Dean Emeritus. In Ateneo de Manila Law School, uh, Father Joaquin Bernas was likewise awarded Dean Emeritus. So that's the concept of Emeritus forever. So he was awarded that, Chairman Emeritus. But as Chairman Emeritus, is symbolic lang yan. No authority, no duties and responsibilities that then uh, uh, were attached to that position. Now, uh, among the among the uh, powers or privileges of a chairman of the board is they get to participate in what you call the initial public offerings of of shares of stock. I don't know some of you may be uh, well versed in playing uh, in the stock market, but there is what you call the IPO. There is a new corporation or maybe an old corporation, but it has not made right its share public and then finally decided to do so. Oh, and then if it is registered with the Philippine Stock Exchange, all right, it will and then it will initially be presented in the board for for uh, 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 transactions now stock exchange it is called an ipo so that is the initial public offering lalo na ngayon ang daming mga program program daming initial public offering na yan yung mayaman yung mga nakaka-discover ng program ng mga gadget na gayon sa initial public offering so usually maliit lang yan now the 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 board of trustee the board of directors of makati stock exchange including the chairman were given an opportunity that before it is published to the public to be offered for sale the shares of stock sila musna ang pinagbibigyan o gusto niyo bumili na bumili na gina so that is the what you call the privilege of being director of the stock market now yung mga hindi nabili sa kalang nila yung offer sa public IPO. So, uh, uh, Loxin now insisted that even if he was no longer the incumbent chairman of the board of directors of Makati Stock Exchange, by virtue of his being appointed or designated chairman emeritus, he is still entitled to participate. And I think that, oh, so titig that Buddha nila. Sila muna, dadaan muna yung, yung kumpanyang yon Kung uh, ito ba ay posibleng uh, uh, kumita at tumakas yung shares. Pag ayaw nila, sakalang ibibigay, ibibenta sa public. You know? Pipilian muna, kumbaga. And tinan nyo. So yan ang ininsist niya. Kasi hindi na siya sinasama. O, di pumalag siya ngayon. So the issue here simply is, would his being designated Chairman Emeritus still create the obligation on the part of the Makati Stock Exchange to include him uh, in that privilege of acquiring IPOs? Gets nyo? All right. So the simple issue in resolving this or, or the, the simple uh, remedy that the Supreme Court did was to determine, o oh, sige, campus, if you're insisting that Makati Stock Exchange still has an obligation 
to allow you to participate uh, in the initial public offering of news of companies and shares of stock. What is your basis for it? Saan mo ihuhugutin yan? So, the Supreme Court went through all five. Is it law? Wala naman batas na nakalagay na ganyan. There is nothing in the corporation law that creates the position of chairman emeritus uh, that uh, provides for its rights and privileges. Wala. So it cannot be a law. Second, contract. Okay. So they looked into the designation or appointment, the certificate na binigay sa kanya. That may be considered to be the contract, the agreement pertaining to his position as chairman emeritus. But in that contract, in the provisions of the certificate, huh, there was nothing there that provided that he was still going to continue on enjoying the privileges that he had then when he was incumbent chairman. So hindi pa pwedeng contract. Yun sana ang pinakamalapit. Wala naman tanggal. And of course, although we have not discussed it yet, but you will already know, impossible yung quasi-contract yan. Also, acts or omission punishable by law. Wala namang crime na ginawa yung Makati. And also, quasi-delic. There was no negligence fault. So, ergo, ano sabi ng Supreme Court? Ay wala. There is nothing that creates a civil obligation to which campus may compel Makati Stock Exchange to fulfill. As there was no source for the alleged obligation of the corporation to him. That therefore reflects the conclusion that the enumeration is exclusive. Do you understand? Now another case that is reported in the textbook, which is always discussed by law professor, is the case of Sagrado Orden de Predicadores versus Nacoco. Actually, the complete title of that is Sagrado Orden de Predicadores e Jesus, Maria, and Joseph. Or, or uh, Jesus, Mary, the order, the religious order of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph versus Nacoco. Uh, uh, Nacoco is national coconut cooperative. Anyway, to make the whole story short, and so that you will understand, because I think you will not understand what you read as reflected in the textbook. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is the story. Uh, it, this is a case that was decided by the Supreme Court immediately after liberation or after World War II. You know, when the Japanese, a little history, when the Japanese came, and uh, were able to occupy the Philippine archipelago, of course, the first thing that they did uh, were to take everything that they needed, that they wanted, that would be necessary for their governance or for their conquest of the Philippine islands. So they were taking public or private property, both real and personal. So, real, mga lupa-lupain, so on and so forth. Now, among those that they saw they needed for the establishment of their barracks somewhere in Bulacan uh, was the property or was the seminary of this congregation, which is referred to as La Orden de Predicadores, Jesus, Maria, and Jose. So it's a religious organization that has been operating or had been operating in the Philippines even before the war, World War II, and that acquired a sizable property somewhere in Bulacan of which they put up their, their seminary, their convent, so on. So the Japanese saw that it would be very useful for their barracks, for a military headquarters in Bulacan. So it was sequestered. And the, the, the nuns, the religious, uh, were shooed away and they disappeared. So uh, you know that 
the Japanese were with us from 1941 up to finally we were liberated in 1945 and in 1946, you understand that we were even given the opportunity to assert again our independence. And, and so for, for four years, this real owner of the property was denied, deprived of possession and use because the Japanese were there. Now, after the liberation, okay, for a few years, two years, almost two years, MacArthur was the supreme commander issuing out orders that would not only, uh, he was in Japan, in Tokyo, but issuing out orders that would cover the entire Asia Pacific that were then subject to the Japanese imperial uh, government. Okay. And among the very first issuances by uh, MacArthur was the order to get back all the properties that were taken by the Japanese, real or personal. And in order to implement that, uh, our, our temporary revolution, as we call government, created uh, the office of the, ano ba yung office na yun? Uh, ayan, no. uh, office of, ano yun? Uh, Asian Property Custodian. No, yan ang, yung custodian muna yan. So, see, so they were responsible for uh, taking back these properties. Pending, uh, MacArthur cited, that they should be returned back to their real owners. But determining who the real owners were took time. So pending the process of determining who are the real owners so these properties could be returned, uh, the alien property custodian thought of, you know, let's make use of it, Muna. And the in, uh, let us uh, utilize it to realize income because the Philippines needed badly money for its rehabilitation, reconstruction. So while La Orden and others were trying to retrieve documents to show proof of their ownership over the property, which took some time, not just for a day or two, but took years. See, ang dami niya ni, parang kaso na rin, may ordinary case. Sabi, pending pa ito, hindi pa namin mababalik. So, pakinabangan natin. Pinalis out. So, it is the, the alien uh, property custodian of the government of the Republic of the Philippines who was in possession and allowed that this property temporarily be leased out to anyone who may be of need of it and willing to pay for rents. So yun na nangyari. Pina, pinaupa yan sa uh, Taiwan Tecosho. And at the same time, Taiwan Tecosho sublist ito na koko. Okay. So from 1945 to about 1948, this was rented out to these two entities who were paying directly to the government of the Philippines. Kasi yun ang lesor eh. Then finally, 1948, the Orden was able to prove their ownership. And so, okay, the government, through a court order, willingly returned possession of property. So, binalik nga. Now, ang issue dito kasi, okay na sana yun, Kaya lang, ang sabi nitong La Orden, kami naman na may-ari yan eh. Ang dapat, okay, yung binayad, yung when Tekoshi and Nakoko started to occupy the property in 1945 to 1943 years, the rent should also be paid to them. Oh, yun ang issue ngayon ng kasong ito. Oh, all right. You understand? Okay. Do Tekoshi or Nakoko, the principal uh, respondent here, have the obligation to pay now the orden of the rentals 
that accrued from this beginning, they were allowed to take possession by the government of the Philippines until 1948. So yun ang issue dyan. Nakita nyo? So, again, what is to be resolved here? Was there a civil obligation on the part of Nakoko to give the back rentals? So again, to resolve the issue, the Supreme Court had to go through the enumeration. Then found in the old civil code, which is merely reiterated in the new. So in yung pisan ulit, law. It was there a law. Wala. There was nothing that could be shown to be the basis for the obligation to pay the back rent. Was there a contract? No. Because the con contract entered into by Nakoko and Tawai was with the government of the Republic of the Philippines, not with the Orden. That's why it said there, they were not privy to the contract. They were not parties to the contract. So hindi pa pwede. Neither could it be a quasi-contract or act or omission. Ano namang kasalanan na ginawa na krimen ng nakoko or quasi-deli. So again, in recognizing that the enumeration in 1157 is exclusive, the Supreme Court said, the Orden has no cause of action to compel payment of the back rentals. So I think those two cases are already sufficient for us to be convinced that this enumeration is exclusive. Kaya naman, every time you are asked, okay, upon being presented a set of facts where it creates an issue on whether or not there is an obligation that is enforceable in the courts of law, meaning to say a civil obligation, you have to first identify who the active subject, the passive, the prestation, and after which you must be able to point out that it must have at least a reason from any of the five. Failure to identify from any of the five, okay, where such may have come from, then there is no obligation that is enforceable in the courts of law. Do you understand? You follow? Huh? Uh, for our okay. Now uh, uh, we will go through the remaining provisions, which actually would be a, a short but concise but a complete discussion of the concept of each of these ties, juridical ties. Law, contracts, quasi-contracts, acts of remission punishable by law, and quasi-delic. Okay? So we, we will now move ahead. Now, uh, before, before pala, ito nakalimutan ko na, uh, before we move ahead, the concept of reciprocal obligation. So, tatanungin natin ngayon, if the, if the obligation creates a reciprocal relationship, all right, uh, who, would be, uh, who would be the passive, who would be the active? What would be the prestation? All right, uh, example, sale, a contract of sale. So, is there an obligation? Answer, yes. So, who is the active? Who is the passive? Now, you remember, you, you know that in a sale, there are two parties involved, the buyer, the seller. But between them, who is the passive? Who is the active? Okay. Now, the role here is for you to identify initially the possible prestations. Now, there is one school of thought that insists that the prestation will only consist of the thing, which is the object of the prestation to give, okay, uh, by the buyer, or by the, by the seller, or the thing sold, yun lang. But we do not agree with that, because that, therefore, practically uh, sets aside also the existing obligation on the part of the buyer. That's why 
in cases of reciprocal obligation, to determine who the passive and the active subjects are, you first have to identify the prestations. In a reciprocal obligation, it would obviously involve two or more prestations. Do you understand, class? So if I sold a car to Aubrey, of which she agreed to pay for half a million, so the question now, oh, who is the active and the passive subject between the two of us? Now, to be able to identify, we need to first establish the prestations. There are two prestations here. What are they? One, to give. Another, to give. Pareho to give. Huwag kayong magkakamali dyan sa to do. Anong idudu dyan? Pareho yan to give in a contract of sale. However, the difference lies in the object of each of these prestations to give. Because one prestation to give involves the object of the thing that is sold, which is the car, and the other is the sum of money. So if you are referring to the prestation to give the car, then obviously I, the seller, would be the passive subject and Aubrey, the buyer, will be the active subject. Now, on the other hand, when you talk of the prestation with the object of the sum of money, it would now be Aubrey that will be considered the passive subject and I, the what? Active subject. But you do have one and the same, what you call now juridical tie, contract of sale. Maintindihan nyo? Oh, kasi baka, baka malito kayo pagdating natin sa mga examples because more often than not, we will be talking of what you call reciprocal obligation. As a matter of fact, that's one of the questions that you will encounter in Negocio Rondesio, oh, quasi-contract, uh, identifying who the active and the passive subjects are and what may be the possible uh, prestations involved. Do you understand? Oh, so clear na yan, ha? Okay. So we can now start off with law. Obligations arising from law. Oh, Article 1158. Naka, naka tatlo na tayo. One, two. Wala <laughs> provision pa lang that. Oh, ano lang kailang guidance. That is a very important provision. Take note, class. Okay. There are uh, one you see, uh, it provides for the nature of an obligation arising from law. Uh, it is somewhat a statutory rule. Anong ibig sabihin? Yeah, you know what a statutory rule is? Uh, the rule as to how to interpret uh, and to implement provisions of the law. So pag sinabing obligations of the law, anong sabi ng Article 1158? Uh, sinabi chat. Obligations arising from law are never presumed. So immediately, okay, what do you learn? It tells you there can be no obligation that arises from law by mere presumption implication. As it continues, only those that are expressly provided for. So they must be clear, unequivocal. They must be expressed in the provisions of the law itself, creating an obligation so as it could be the basis of an enforceable right. And they did that, huh? Only those that are expressly provided for by this code and special law. So, anong code ito? Or by this book? Ito, book on obligation. And the special law, other laws. Commercial law, taxation, so on. Clear, dapat, clear, 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 dapat yan. Because if it is not clear, then there can be no implication, there can be no presumption. Nakuha ninyo. Okay, all right. So, uh, uh, it's very obvious now as to how you will identify whether or not a law creates an obligation. All right, so. Example, what are examples of 
of, of obligations arising from law, the most popular as provided for by almost all uh, textbooks, the payment of income tax. It is an obligation created by law. Oh, is it clear? Yes. What law? The National Internal Revenue Code. It's very clear there. The provisions tells you that if ever you are given an opportunity to realize income, then a portion of which you must set aside to be paid to the government as taxes. You see? So that is an obligation created by law. That is not by agreement between you and DIR. No. Automatic. Yan. It is the law itself that imposes on it by virtue of the provision. Another is the obligation to support. The family code in the law on support clearly provides for it that parents do have the obligation to give support to their minor children. These are two good examples of obligations that are created by law. You follow class? Now, it cannot be asserted if, see, it does not expressly or clearly state so. The, uh, the example that I usually give, a hypothetical example is, okay, uh, you know that the law on, on support tells us that parents should support children, correct? So as a matter of fact, uh, the change from the old civil code to the new, to the family code, that which you have studied already, is the obligation now is solidary, joint and solidary between mother and father. Kasi yung pinag-aralan namin noon, ang principally liable yung tatay. If the father is not capable of supporting, the mother becomes subsidiarily liable. That is why during our time, if support is deprived of children, minor, the suit must first be filed against the father. And if the father is found not to be financially able to support, then the mother is subsidiarily liable. Okay. But now you learn that this obligation to support created by law is now joint in solidarity. You will understand this as we go to chapter 3. Ayan ang medyo mahirap-hirap sinasabi, pero madali lang yan. Now, it is solidarity. Ang ibig sabihin, any or both of them may already be sued. Okay. So is there a civil obligation? Yes. Kaya a child who is deprived by parents of support, you know already what consists of support, food in the stomach, uh, roof on the head, clothing, it includes now already what? It includes also education and medical assistance. So if ever a child is deprived of this by parents who easily could have provided for. Is there a cost of action to soon? Yes! And against whom? Both parents now. Do you understand? Hindi yan pinag-usapan. Hindi naman yan pinag-usapan na abang hindi pa pinapangat yung bata. Nasabihin ng bata, oh, nanay, tatay, bago ako lumabas, mag-agree muna kayo susuportan niyo ako. Ay, hindi. So it's not a contract. But rather it is created by law itself. By the fact of their relationship, the law declares that existence of that obligation to provide. So uh, this is the example that I, I gave. Okay. Now, assuming, example, there is a legislation that is passed, pinasa, okay, amending the provision of support, expanding its scope, this time identifying elder brothers obliged now to support their younger brothers. Yan ang batas, bago. That is the new law. Elder brothers are now obliged to support younger brothers. Now, here comes Maria, a, 
a younger sister of Pedro, who insists now that by virtue of the law, Pedro is liable to support her. Do you understand? Now the issue is, okay, is there a cause of action? Meaning, can Maria, through the courts of law, compel Pedro to support her on the basis of the amended law on support? Uh, what is your answer? The answer is no. Why? Because you will know what is clear that the law creates is an obligation of an elder brother to a younger brother. Now, can you not raise the issue? Oh, sir, if, if the elder brother is obliged to support a younger brother, more so should he support a younger sister? Can there be no presumption or implication in that regard? Oh, basing it on natural. Kung merong mang mas nangangailangan ng suporta ng nakakatandang kapatid na lalaki ay yung nakakabatang kapatid na babae kaysa yung sa lalaki. Di ba? So, can that argument be sustained in order to justify a cost of action that will prosper against Pedro initiated by Maria? Answer, no. Because the law says Ang now, it only identified elder brothers to support younger brothers. There can be no implication or presumption of the inclusion of younger sisters as Article 1158 declares, cannot be presumed, cannot be implied. It has to be expressed. It has to be unequivocable. Or, or yes, unequivocal. Now, it did Anyway, oh, so the case there, Inan, oh, the very important there case, uh, which is a very clear illustration, is the case in, uh, of the well, all first year students must know this. I think you took this up already. The case of Pelayo versus Lauron and the more recent case of uh, Ayala uh, Malls, correct? Versus Campus. Ayala Malls, ba yun? Uh, it's there in your, in your book. It's the case of uh, OSG, Office of the Solicitor General versus Ayala Land Development Corporation. Hmm. What is the case all about? Oh, let me just tell you the story. Ito ang dahilan kung bakit pag pumunta kayo sa SM, sa Robinsons, magpaparada kayo, magbabayad pa kayong hinayupak na yon. Kayo na nga mamimili doon, magbabayad pa kayo ng parking yon. It is because of this case. Okay, now what does what does the uh, the, the case all is all about? All right. uh, there is a there is a uh, an ordinance uh, that were that was passed and approved by the by the uh, Metropolitan uh, Commission, Metro Manila Commission, that mall owners must provide for parking spaces for their customers now the size of the uh, size or area of the of the parking space will depend of course on the size of the of the mall proportion so of course the bigger the mall is the bigger the the parking space that you must provide so kaya yan obligado hindi ka pwede gumawa ng ng mall na walang parking space so kaya hindi ba mandami yan sm mega mall Aura, XSM, yun pa sa Mall of Asia, and puro yan may parking space dyan because of this requirement. Now, 
the issue here is, all right, the main issue is whether or not, uh, uh, because, uh, so the, the balls complied, Ayala, Robinson, SM, but in complying, they required payment, di ba? Babayad. So this is where uh, the city of Mandaluyong initiated for and in behalf of its citizens against Ayala and SM and others that by virtue of the law, the ordinance of the MCC, they must provide for the parking space for free. You see? So, uh, it was alleged that it was an obligation arising from the law. What law? The ordinance. So the issue here is, does the small owner or do the small owners have the obligation to provide for parking spaces to its customers for free? All right. So all the Supreme Court had to do was to scrutinize the ordinance. Unfortunately, the ordinance merely says that they are supposed to provide for sufficient spaces for parking, period. It did not make mention that it has to be offered to the public for free. On that basis, therefore, sabi ng Supreme Court, there is no obligation created by the ordinance that can expressly state its duty to provide for the parking spaces for free. Kaya, kawawa naman tayo. Mamibili na lang, magbabayad pa ng parking space. Oh, yan ang kagawa niya. Kaya talo ang OSG dyan. The, the lawyer for the, for the uh, 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 Mandaluyong government. So yung Mandalo si Abalos Sana ang humirit niyan. Kaya lang, yun na nga. What did the Supreme Court use? The Supreme Court used only Article 1158. It was shown that although the obligation to provide for parking spaces was clear, it cannot be implied that such obligation includes the duty to have the public use the parking space for free. That means use it, but they can charge you. That's exactly what it is now. So if you want to uh, 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 revise this, uh, then you might as well uh, be a congressman and have legislation passed where these parking spaces should be free. I know. Ah, oh, I think that is sufficient already. In so far as though so. The rule is, how do you identify again the existence of an obligation arising from law? It must be expressed. So if one confronts you about the matter of a law that appears to be creating an obligation, if it is not clear, if it is doubtful, correct? Meaning to say, the rule is, if a law is doubtful, remember a doubtful law? It is susceptible of two or more interpretations. So if you're confronted with a law where it may be interpreted to create an obligation, and at the same time, it also may be interpreted not to create one, by virtue of 1158, you will have to resolve against the existence of the creation of the obligation. So that is what the first part of the provision tells you. Obligations arising from law are never presumed. Only those that are expressly provided for by this code and special law are demandable. Now, the last portion, what is it all about? Once you have identified the existence of a civil obligation, the next question you are to ask is, okay, how? How do you about? How are you to give? How are you to to uh, fulfill the obligation to do. For example, how are you to support the minor children by virtue of the provisions of the civil code that creates the obligation to support? 
How do you pay taxes? How much? When? How? Well, yan ang sinasagot ng last portion. When it says, and shall be governed by the precepts of the law that creates them, and as to what has not been foreseen by the provisions of this book. So it barely tells you that. Okay, the the how, the process of the how or uh, how to fulfill it. Uh, the law is expected to provide you for the same. So, for example. Pay taxes. The NLRC creates it and at the same time provides for the manner by which it is to be fulfilled. Together with BIR, issuances, revenue regulations. So susundin mo lang yun, provided for. So shall be governed. So every uh, April 15 of the taxable of every year, you must be able to have paid already your taxes for the income that you realized in the past taxable year. So ngayon, 2023, uh, April 15, nakalagay dyan sa BIR regulation, dapat mabayaran mo yung taxes, okay? Uh, on the income that you received during the taxable year, January to December 2022. How much? Oh, the the National Internal Revenue Code provides for the computation. Mga percentage, percentage, mga deduction, allowable, uh, allow, and so on and so forth. So it provides for. Do you understand, class? Support. Okay. The Family Code provides for what is to be uh, provided for the minor by virtue of the obligation to support, which said, okay, the necessities, food, shelter, clothing, education, and medical. So it's provided for them, not them. Now, the issue here is, what if a law, take note of this, because tinanong ito sa bar, huwag kayong magpapaloko, if the law creates clearly expressly, unequivocally, an obligation to give, but it falls short to provide for the procedure, how to fulfill it. Nagets nyo? Do you understand? For example, let's say, the National Internal Revenue provides that you have to pay taxes. See? But unfortunately, the National Internal Revenue Corps for sure to providing for how much, when, how, nothing. Or the law of support in the family code. It clearly says oh, parents should support their minor children. But it also failed to provide for what constitutes support, when, how. Now the issue is, is there an obligation? Ah, oh, naku, huwag kayong magpapaloko. Ang sagot dyan is yes. But sir, sabi mo, only those that are expressly. Eh, hindi ba yan? Hindi yan. Engot, it is expressly provided for. What is merely absent would be the process, the how. And the validity of the existence of the civil obligation does not require a clear expression of the procedure or the how it must be fulfilled. Basta meron yan dyan, obligasyon niya. So ang tanong mo, eh sir naman, o oh, yan, o eh, ano, ano namin gagampanan? Ayang ka na, yan na, yun na kalagay yung last pro, so provision. And as to what has not been foreseen by the provisions of this book. Anong book ito? The Bible? Oh, no. By the law on obligation. So that is why your answer to that question on whether or not there is an obligation arising from a law that although it expressly clearly establishes its existence, it falls short of providing for the manner by which the prestation was to be fulfilled. 
Now, it does not prevent the existence of the obligation class because the issue as to the how will now be tackled by the provisions of the law on obligations. Kaya, remember I told you in the beginning, you will always find the provisions of the law on obligation in the civil code supplemental. Pag merong kinakapos na hindi nyo alam kung anong batas, okay, ang kailangan gampanan o ipairal, apply the law on obligation because it is really what you call a narrative of the basic principles of equity, justice, and fair. Kaya supplemental yan. O, yan ang sinasabi ko sa it always comes to supplement the fulfillment of any obligation arising from an issue, a legal issue where it involves any field of the law you know, whether it is constitutional, whether it is commercial, whether it is uh, a persons and family, whether it's criminal, the law on obligation will always come in. So that is one. Second, all right. It being supplemental, yung provisions of the civil code, you will encounter some laws that may provide for contrary uh, provisions. Maybe it's a bit conflicting. Oh, conflicting. Oh, the manner of which performing that obligation created by this law is stated by the law in this manner. But you will find out the provisions of this, the, the provisions of the uh, uh, civil code on obligation says otherwise. So there is conflicting. So again, statutory rule you must resolve. Between the two, which will you uphold? Obviously, because the rule of obligation is nearly supplemental, the principle which is the law creating that obligation will just have to be upheld. For example, uh, the law on obligation provides, you will find out in article 1169, that before a debtor may be held liable for damages because of delay, generally there has to be what you call demand. Okay, now, the National Internal Revenue Code states otherwise. The National Internal Revenue Code says that if the taxpayer who is unable to file and pay his tax returns on or before April 15, the following day, he is already in delay of which the government is entitled now to damages, penalties, meaning hindi kailangan ng demand. So, what would prevail? The Civil Code or the National Internal Revenue Code? Of course, it would be the latter because it is the provisions of the law creating the obligation to pay taxes that would have to be principally applied in determining the manner to fulfill because the Civil Code is only supplemental. So, to recapitulate what just 1158 tell you, number one, it tells you as to how to identify the existence of an obligation arising from law. Second, it also provides you as to how you are to fulfill that obligation. And third, that in cases of conflict between the provisions of the civil code on the law on obligation and the provisions of the law that creates a particular obligation, it is the latter meaning the law that creates the obligation that must be upheld. Ay, naku, ang linaw, linaw, naku, na punyetang yan, baka hindi nyo pa yan. O, yung sabi niya. O, so, uh, ano, ano ngayon? Uh, so, binigay ko na sa inyo yung OSG versus, of course, uh, I do not know whether uh, you still, did, did you take a Pelayo versus Lauron? Ha? Huh? All freshmen, law students should know that. 
But anyway, just to refresh you, if you do not remember it anymore, uh, Pelayo versus Lauron is, you remember the, this is the story of the, the daughter-in-law who suddenly had the urge to give birth, while still with the parents-in-law. Okay, so uh, uh, because she was about to give birth, uh, while there they were in their place with the parents-in-law, the parents-in-law got in touch with the doctor to assist in the childbirth. So the doctor that they called uh, agreed and came, assisted. Malas malas na, namatay, namatay. Hindi lang yung bata, pati yung daughter-in-law. Tragic yun, di ba? Na tragic. Tingnan mo tapos, ang kapal ng doktor, ay ayan ang maganda sa doktor eh. Med, isa, magamot niya, umamatay, bayad ka. <laughs> At least, ang abogado, may tinatawag lang na success fee. Pag italo, wala. Pero ang doktor, whether mabuhay niya o mamatay, bayad. So, no, after that, sinigil ngayon ng doktor, yung parents in law. On the ground that, there was an implied contract. Ano yung implied contract nila? It was the parents in law who made the offer to the doctor to render services. So, on, on obviously, for a fee. For the services. Uh, the doctor never intended that the services would be for free. No. And then he agreed. So there was an implied contract. The question is, all right, well, question is, could there be that implied contract? Answer, no. So did that mean that uh, there was no obligation to pay the doctor for the services rendered? Answer, there was. But it did not arise out of contract, but rather it was from law. And if you will now apply the law that created the obligation to pay the doctor, you will find out that it would not be the parents in law who would be the proper debtors, but rather the husband. On what basis? Of course, also on the basis of support that husband and wife has the obligation to support each other. Oh, they did yan yo? Ha? Kaya, kaya pag tuma, because kung, kung inaphold yung yung inisipin ninyo, kung inaphold ang Supreme Court yung contention ng parents in ng, ng doktor na it is the parents in law who should pay for it on the basis of an implied contract kasi yung parents in law ang tumawag sa kanya so may implied agreement na niya ang contract na okay uh, could you imagine the implication sigurado ako kung kunyari morbid as it may appear Ayan, yeah, naging nag, ayan, yeah, naglelecture ako dito sa inyo. Bigla na lang akong nakita ninyo na nanigas ako. Ah. Eh, alam niyo yung kaso ni Pilayo na inaphold na yung parents-in-law. Ang liable kasi yung parents-in-law ang tumawag. <laughs> kasi walang tatawag sa inyo mga hudas kayo. <laughs> kasi kapag kayo tumawag sa St. Luke's, Ayari, kayo magbabayad ng gastos ko. Di ba? Oo. <laughs> that is what, if you will take note, in that particular case, the obligation is now one of those other quasi-contracts. You will find out uh, that who a stranger who helps out, okay? That stranger for the expenses that he incurred, or she incurs, will now have a right to enforce reimbursement or payment from those who by law are obliged to pay. Oh, kaya tumawag naman kayo. Kasi, oh, 
bumunta nga dito ang ambulansya, so may charge na yun, yung doktor sa ER, may charge na yun, nabuhay ako. O, mamatay man ako, mabuhay ako, pwede nyo namang singilin o hindi naman kayo ang hahabulin, kundi yung asawa ko, yung mga anak ko. O, naintindihan nila. Hmm. Ano pa ba yan ang hindi ko tinatamaan sa o, ano pa yung buntang... Alright. So, sunod, contracts. Let's go to contracts na. Oh, that's why we need to already be be introduced to the concept of a contract. What is a contract? Article 1305. 1305 tells you oh, uh, 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 the, it is a meeting of mind okay, between two parties where where one binds himself with respect to another to give something to do or not to do a thing. Parang ganon. Okay. Yan ang konsepto ng contract sa civil code. So what does it tell you? Okay. But before we go to that, of course, uh, let us now uh, see, look at Article 1159. Yung sunod na. So what does Article 1159 tell us? It tells us that obligations of uh, obligations arising from contracts right sana yon hindi ko na memorize yan uh, eh, obligations arising from from contracts have the force and law between the contracting parties and should be complied with in good faith you see it should be complied with in good faith oh see So it is a law. It's the positive law. Di ba sabi natin, a civil obligation arising from a positive law? So ang agreement, may positive law ba yan? Yes. What is that? By virtue of 1159, it is the agreement itself. A law but with limited application between the parties only. Kaya may tinatawag kang privity of contracts. A party generally who is not privy to the contract or even kasama doon sa kasunduan cannot be bound by the provisions of the agreement. So in effect, it is law only between the parties. And Article 1159 declares that it must be complied with in good faith. So we go now to 1305. What is a contract? A contract. Uh, it's a meeting of minds whereby one all right, binds himself with respect to another to, to give something to do or not to do. Yan. Yan na ang definition na. Now, what do you learn from this definition? Ito na. Okay. So, what do you learn from this definition? Number one, there is nothing there that tells you that contracts should always be in writing. There is nothing there that tells you that contracts should always be expressed. Ergo, contracts may be, may be in writing, may be oral, it can even be implied, it can even be pressured. That is why in determining whether a contract creates an obligation, should the contract Always, just like the rule in obligations arising from law, expressly, clearly, unequivocally declare the existence of that obligation. Answer, no! Naintindihan nyo? Ulitin ko ha, hindi ba sabi natin, obligations arising from law? In order that we conclude its existence and enforceability, the law itself, must expressly, clearly, and equivocally provide for it. Because if there is doubt, you cannot make a presumption, neither by implication. However, obligations arising from contract, may that obligation be presumed, implied? Answer, yes. Because there is nothing that requires it always to be expressed in order for it to be enforceable. Just like what you found in Article 1158. Oh, gets you? 
Now, of course. Okay, so. Because I told that the first thing that you have to learn in, in obligations arising from contract. That's why, sabi ko nga sa inyo, uh, sumakay ka lang ng, ng uh, grab. May contract na kayo. Hindi mo na pwedeng iwasan yung obligasyon na yun. Sumakay ka ng jeep, may contract na kayo. Tricycle, may contract na kayo. Which are all implied. Presumed. Okay? Now, Uh, the, the second thing that that you need to all right. So uh, there would be provision. It will be law between you and the other contracting party and must be complied with in good faith. Now, in relation to 1305, you have to go to 1306. What is the nature of the right to contract? Uh, see, it tells us. The contracting parties may establish stipulation, clauses, terms, conditions as may be deemed convenient. This is what you call freedom to contract. As a matter of fact, it is one of those that are enshrined, that is enshrined in no less than our constitution. I think it is in, in Article 3, Section 10, if I am not mistaken. It is what you call now The, the the principle of uh, uh, non impairment of obligations of contracts the right of individuals to enter into agreements stipulations clauses that may they deem proper and convenient you follow okay proper and convenient and once agreed to, becomes law between them. Now, what do we mean by this? This is what you refer to as the autonomy of contract. You will, you will come across this again as among the characteristics of contracts when we come to the chapter itself. Autonomy of contract means that not even the state could intervene and change the tenor, amend the provisions, or revise the clauses that you freely agreed to. Hindi pwede pakialaman yan because that will now constitute what you call impairment of the, of the obligations of contract of which the parties have freedom. Kaya may tinatawag na autonomy for contracts. So pag tinanong kayo, uh, autonomy of contracts, oh, autonomy from whom? From where? From the state or from any other third party who may not have in any way involved themselves or simply privity to the contract. Okay. Uh, okay. Anong oras tayo, uh, Jem? Are we until 5.30? Ano uh, po? Um, two hours lang po dapat yung 